KP classes dedicated to excellence. Hi everyone. In today's series, we will be discussing about a very, very famous graphic designer of all time. Uh, the whole idea behind uh, discussing these uh, design pioneers is to understand that how they started their work, how they started their journey, right? What inspired them or why are they considered iconic uh, designers? Right. So we'll try and understand uh, their journey. We'll try and understand that how a lot of um, design work today is being inspired by them. And also there is uh, there was another prime motive of discussing about this particular designer, Paul Rand is because even we got inspired by him at some point of time and we keep them as a benchmark right definitely we all have our own inspirations uh, and at times we need to look up to the pioneers to, uh, to see how they began their journey and what all they learned and how they explored in the design field i hope this is going to be really very inspiring and helpful for all of you so let's get started so here we have uh, mr paul rand he was born on 15th august 1914 Right. He is considered to be the most famous and iconic graphic designers of all time. We will take a look on Rand's life and honor his work and introduce to this pioneer. Right. So to begin with, since a very early age, he had a keen interest in painting, designing, which reflects through his painting signs for his father's grocery store and for his school events now we notice that a lot of our uh, lot of us have started it early even before going into our design um, school a lot of you had you know uh, started taking up small jobs or small projects which uh, exploited your creativity and same is with all of us we have done it in our school we have uh, done it in our um, you know family if we have to say create a poster or a greeting card you know something of that sort so exactly this is what he did he was before being a graphic designer he was also a painter. So he was basically a very creative person who would like to explore uh, different avenues of visual art. So he started with painting signages for his father's grocery store. Okay, so Rand developed this graphic sense through self-education largely. He, uh, as he voraciously read European magazines, discovering the work of Cassandra. Right. So he was a self-taught uh, person, although he went to some of the iconic design colleges like Pratt Institute, then Parsons School of Design and Art Students League. So he went, he definitely went uh, into these uh, design colleges, but his basic uh, basically, he, he was a self-taught designer. And this is true for most of us. Although we go to different design schools for learning, for getting a formal education, but the most part of our learning happens by doing things on our own, by exploring things on our own, right? So exactly this is what even uh, he did. And this also gave me a certain amount of confidence because when I used to... Um, learn from my own experiences at times I used to feel whether I am on the right path or not so by reading about this uh, particular designer uh, I was introduced to him when I was in college so I read a lot of books on him and saw a lot of his work and got my inspiration and that is where at that point of time, I knew that, okay, I'm on the right path. So if I'm exploring something on my own, if I'm um, getting um, my own inspirations and um, I'm converting into my work, so I'm not on the wrong path, right? So here, he was definitely a 
self taught person and as all of us we do we uh, look into images we browse through the net and all at that point of time a lot of designers they uh, got their um, inspiration from various magazines various magazines and newspapers which was already prevalent at that time so here um, are some of the books or magazines like this particular magazine which is a german magazine uh, gibrash graphic um, he took a lot of inspiration and you can see what sort of uh, imagery is over here so he liked a particular style of work and maybe um, involuntarily he looked into those sort of work that uh, he found visually very appealing and which also aligned with his own uh, liking so here we have an image of cassandra again a very very iconic person uh, from whom uh, paul rand got his inspiration in fact, um, this particular magazine is now known as Novum and which had a very, very important uh, role in um, getting uh, Paul Rand inspired to do his work in terms of graphic. So, his career started with, um, get, with getting into the editorial of magazines as art directors so he was an art director later on he went into advertising and uh, in his final stage he got into corporate identity so here he started his career at a very early age i think he was just 21 or 23 years old and he joined as a uh, um art director so here we can see one of the noteworthy contributions was with apparel art so he had joined apparel art uh, which is now known as gq we all know about gq so he uh, at that point of time he joined apparel art um, as a art director and a lot of his uh, work was appreciated he had a very different approach as you can see these uh, must have been uh, done somewhere, you know, uh, in, in the 1930s, uh, but still they look so fresh and they look so modern. So I will tell you how his work stood out and how his work was also relevant even at this point of time. So you can see some of the visuals um, which he had created the cover pages so let's see some of his notable uh, work also again here we have uh, cover pages of some magazines for which he worked and as you can see uh, these are again very modern very minimalistic and all of these they tell a story he had his own style to tell a story another very important uh, inspiration that he took was from the contemporary art which was prevalent at that time so during that time whatever art movements were going on uh, please do remember that in the starting of the 20th century a lot of things were happening in in the world in terms of art in terms of uh, design in terms of war industrial revolution or maybe uh, business or great Dis depression so a lot of things were happening so everything was um, interrelated and he not only took uh, inspiration from other graphic designers or uh, some of the existing work of uh, graphic designers but also took inspiration from a lot of the principles of art which was prevalent at that time so here is uh, another example again a strong focus minimalistic elements and elements telling a story right it does not have a human figure it does not have too many visuals but one strong visual giving out a important message
next was after he um, had his stint with uh, the editorial or the art direction he got into advertising so this was like the second uh, most important phase of his life which started somewhere in 1941 and um, again in the art field also he had uh, created his own niche and his own mark and Please remember, at this point of time, he is already an established graphic designer. So his um, remarkable work started, we will go a few slides uh, behind. So it started with this particular magazine direction. Okay, um, I have shown you some of the cover pages. So this was comparatively a smaller magazine uh, if you compare it with a parallel art at that point of time. So always remember when um, a company is at a growing stage or it's very small, it gives you a lot of freedom. Okay. They, so this is what this particular company did to Paul Rand. It gave him a lot of freedom to um, explore and exploit all the resources and then he came up with his own designs of uh, cover page which not only just worked in in terms of communicating a cover page but it also gave a particular niche to this uh, this uh, magazine as well always remember the graphics the kind of colors that you use they have they create they help to create a niche for the product so this is exactly what happened and you can see the transition so he joined uh, this particular magazine he created a niche for them and his next step was advertisement which uh, gave him a full fledged um, you know opportunity to exploit his um, quality so by now he is uh, already an established name and he joined this uh, particular advertising uh, company which was very known at that particular time they had accounts of really good brands at that time so he started working with the uh, with the logos with the uh, whole advertising and posters and all of these things now you might note something over here um you might see that okay the, the colors are like really solid and they are standing out there is a strong focus and at the same time it is extremely simple right and i will um um, I, I, I'll um, like discuss a very funny situation with you. Some, someone saw these uh, particular images and they said, oh, this has been done by such a graphic, such an iconic graphic designer. I think anybody can do it. These are just certain lines and uh, dots. That's it. But no, this had a very, very important impact on the people at that point of time. And that is what is important, creating an impact at the right time to the right sort of, right kind of audience. So, uh, again, you can see he is trying to communicate using his typography as well. Now, here uh, the typography, the role of typography has come in, right? So, you can see the type over here, you can see, uh, uh, see the images which are again, uh, very elemental right you can perceive it as a human figure but at the same time it is just made of um, triangles and lines so he is trying to communicate in a very unconventional manner he is trying to use the typography over here and trying to include the typography in the image itself now Again, this is not his work, but this is what I wanted to discuss with you. There is a stark difference between these two slides. Now, what was happening during that time, typography was not given so much of importance and visual and typography were considered two different things. And in any advertisement, a lot of uh, text material was given. So, obviously, um, you would nobody would have so much time to read through everything 
and they might not even remember because all of these posters are somewhere or the other looking same right they have a very uh, this was the style of images that was common at that point of time so he introduced a completely new approach where he started, uh, this is all the example of the old ones and you can see so much of uh, text is given over here. So, contrast to that, his posters or his adver uh, advertisements were very, very minimalistic. He used typography in a very smart manner and he introduced the type as part of the whole visual, right? So, this is how, this is what helped him to create a niche at that point of time and please remember that that was a time when uh, industrial revolution was at its peak right so these um, things these uh, career opportunities like graphic design and advertising were really picking up pace and everybody wanted something new right every day something new was being introduced and to create an impact at that point of time through your work was extremely important and that is what he did and he was pretty successful doing that so here are some of the examples and again one of the iconic uh, logo that he did was for ibm now here it's a literal uh, he has given this uh, thing as i b or m and as far as I know, they are using this B. IBM is still using the B in some of their corporate identities. identities. This is no more in use, but uh, yes, it was introduced at that particular point of time. So again, you see uh, some of the posters. They are simple, yet strong, yet making an impact. And uh, there is a very strong positioning of these particular posters right in the mind of the viewers again this is these are just few examples uh, mr disney hat so he created a whole corporate identity for this as well now the next slide um, you would notice his um, signature right so he was having this habit of signing each and every work that he did somewhere or the other he would hide his signature in the work so uh, why did he do so so he had a very very uh, simple uh, thing to say he said i signed simply as a way of publicizing myself right so please remember at that point of time publicity and reaching out to the common people was very difficult. Today, we can't imagine that because everything is a click away. We want to be popular. We want to sell our product. We make a page on Instagram. We create a website and we reach out. There is more outreach to the common people. But at that point of time, forget about social media or the internet. Even a television was a luxury, right, uh, for a lot of people. So how do we reach out to people? We reach out at that point of time, people used to reach out, designers used to reach out through posters, through big hoardings or newspapers or pamphlets. So he wanted to create um, his own niche and he wanted to create and publicize his work. And very smartly, he tried to always incorporate his signature into all his work. So this was like the first uh, ever I mean a lot of people used to publicize their work but in the modern times he started uh, to understand the power of publicity and that's what he did and this is for this is true for all of us this is true for all of us we need to publicize ourselves we need to publicize our work so that uh, people not only um, like our designs or like our product but they also have to relate to the person who's uh, creating it so somewhere or the other that connection is very very important and this got him this landed him to the third uh, phase of his career which was corporate design
Now, what is corporate design? Corporate design is creating a corporate identity, creating a persona. Like you have PR, public relation, who are creating a persona for film stars, for politicians, for businessmen. In the same way, we have a design team who is creating a persona or a character for the corporate companies, which we call as corporate design or corporate identity and he, since he was very good in creating and publicizing his own work. So this is what was his next step. So creating corporate identity involves a lot of things starting from the logo design, starting from the symbols that the company is going to use, what the company stands for, the taglines, the uh, jingles, or the look of the uh, mascots right or creating um, visiting cards collaterals like uh, letterheads packaging etc so a lot of things goes into it but we are looking at few of his very very iconic uh, work for example i spoke about ibm right which till date they are using the design which was created by paul rand so that was back in 1956 when he was looking at the uh, logo of IBM. So he thought that I have drawn some lines over here, yellow lines. So this is to show that he thought that it is the rhythm is increasing and somewhere it was uh, very disturbing for him. So he wanted to break this particular rhythm because when your eyes are moving, there is more weight on this particular part. So he worked on it and he tried to incorporate these stripes now one of this particular design was uh, there uh, for a very long time and as you can see in 1967 i think he came up with this particular design and later on in 1972 he created the whole thing in the form of stripe to break that visual weight uh, or to break that whole uh, increasing order the the weight which is increasing in a particular order right so he created this particular uh, logo he came up with the idea of stripe and it worked a lot and till date ibm is using these then he came up of course he came up with several several um, uh, designs in terms of uh, posters and logo and i have shown some of the um, logo designs over here we will be discussing about one or two very very important and iconic logo and uh, also when we were talking about his art direction phase i spoke that he always wanted to use the typography or the letters as part of a whole image or a symbol so this is what you can see enron is is it's not just a word but it's the whole symbol okay or the whole logo see he incorporated both the things here also we can see the typography is being incorporated and it's not just written in a simple lettering format but it has been uh, changed into a particular format we will be discussing about next as well right here also um, now this was a time when the letters and the symbols were used separately so he was one of the uh, first few graphic designers who incorporated the whole thing together he used the theories like just all theories etc to understand that how a negative and the positive space would um, interact with each other and accordingly he used the colors so as you can see, this is the uh, logo for Yale University, UPS, which is uh, which was a packaging and courier and uh, courier company. Again, that was very very famous. So he also taught in a uh, few universities, including the Yale University, because this is a very um, common practice by a lot of designers or or artists they like to share their ideas with the new generation they like to uh, evolve this is also a way to evolve 
right? So teaching is also a way to evolve, sharing your ideas, having interaction with the new uh, generation always helps everybody to um, be aware about the present situation. So this is exactly what he did. Apart from his very busy schedule and his very happening career, he got into uh, education and he wanted to teach the younger generation. Now, after this, we have uh, Steve Jobs image right in front of us. So you must be thinking that why do we have Steve Jobs over here? That's because, to, so that you remember uh, that he came up, uh, once he left uh, Apple, he wanted to come up with his own uh, company and he gave Paul Rand a chance. He looked at no one else, but he looked at Paul Rand and he said, okay, I need an identity for my company. I don't have too much of time. I have limited amount of uh, resources to put into the advertisement. Also, I need a logo which is uh, which has both the typography as well as the symbol okay now try to understand over here at that point of time it was very common to use a symbol separately and to use the typo typographic uh, logo separately these two were not really combined together and to create a uh, you know, to to really promote both of these uh, two aspects of the logo would require a lot of time, energy and resources, right? Why? Because gradually it would create an impression into people's mind. Like in today's time, if you just look at this, you know it's Apple. It need not be written over there, right? Until and unless somebody is staying un under the rock they would know that, okay, this is uh, a logo of Apple, right? But this was very difficult uh, for Steve Jobs to come up with a symbol that has both the name of the company. Because if you create a symbol and you don't have the name of the company, then people would get confused. They would not be able to correlate. He wanted that correlation to happen. So the symbol and the text he wanted it together so that if the symbol is there, like here, you can see some examples. Uh, that's a um, personal computer and you can see the symbol over here. And at the same time, it has the name of the company. So to um, ease this particular task, what uh, Paul Rand did, now of course I cannot discuss the whole design process of Paul Rand, but there are some very important aspects that we are going to discuss over here. He um, always said that as doctors, when you go to a doctor, what do they do? They tell you what treatment you want. They don't give you options that, okay, you can do this also, maybe you can do this, you can do this. And they do, don't just leave it to the patient. But what do they do? They give you a particular instruction. This is exactly what even Paul Rand uh, believed in. He said, I would not be giving too many options to my clients. I, why should I uh, leave the options to them? I will be choosing an option and presenting it to my clients. He had a unique way of presentation. He came up with a whole... Um, with, with the whole um, document, he documented each and every step and how he uh, reached a particular design. So that journey was documented and he used to give uh, brochure handouts to all his clients and the higher officials who were sitting of that particular company and he would involve the person also into the design process while he's speaking. So what happens when you know the process, you get accustomed to it, your acceptability increases. So we'll go back to the previous slide. So here for the next, what he did was he incorporated the text. And if you can see, the E is in lowercase. Uh, why is it in lowercase? So one of the reason which Paul Rand had was if you write the E in uppercase, so it looks like exit, 
EXT. EXT was coming together and whenever you go to a movie hall or a uh, mall or something, you see the uh, text written exit. So that particular text is really in, engraved in our mind. So he said that no, something is off with the uppercase. So let me just make it a lowercase so that it does not look like uh, as if it's re resembling the word uh, exit. And there is a sort of focus also on the E. And he created a whole brochure which uh, he used to present. He used to call it as uh, presentation booklets, which would help people to understand and to follow the process. So, for example, he um, this is an example of the design booklet that he created for a particular company called Education First. Now, he had another important aspect uh, regarding logo design over here. He said that the logo need not represent the uh, nature of business, right? It is the logo uh, which might be, which might become famous and then people, let people start associating it with the nature of business. Like apple, it's a simple symbol of an apple. It does not say what the company's business is. Or if you look at Nike, so you would, uh, you, you look at the symbol of the Nike, it does not resemble the nature of the business of Nike, which is clothing and um, footwear primarily, okay? So this is one thing that he uh, really stressed on that logos need not uh, visually represent the nature of the business. They just have to be strong symbols on its own so that people can uh, relate to it or people can remember it. So here is the education first and some of the glimpse of the of uh, the booklet. So it was about education so he wrote this whole ABCD and he highlighted E and F very smartly. Then some examples of where the logo would come, what should be the back uh, of the main booklet, the, what should be the back uh, cover like. Then he, he gave a little detail about what is uh, the logo design of a particular graphic is all about, how would it uh, benefit the company, etc. So what happens is by now, when a, uh, when people are reading it and everything, they get involved in the whole design process. Then he would give certain um, options which he himself had uh, like uh, deleted them. So these are like some exploratory uh, options. And then in the booklet, uh, in one of the pages, he had this whole, uh, you know, uh, image. And people might be wondering what is this image all about. So here he explained what you have just seen is the embryo of a graphic idea. The most trying part of a design problem, especially the design of a logo, is to find an idea that visually epitomizes an enterprise of some sort. And that is also both appropriate and utilitarian. Formalizing. Pinning it down on paper is the next most difficult step. The sound wave pattern. So here we had a sound wave pattern that we just saw. This is a sound wave pattern and he has explained it over here. The sound wave pattern serves a clear purpose. It is conceptually and graphically appropriate. It provides a visual device that is both decorative and uh, mnemonic and is easily incorporated as an organic and inseparable part of the logo. The pattern provides a needed contrast of the straight lines of E and F. The italics add emphasis. So you can see he has given each and every detail about this particular simple um, logo. It might look simple, but the kind of impact that it is going to create is very important. Then he gave some uh, examples of how it would look uh, along with different languages. And here were some of the placements. And later on, um, 
he wrote that how a logo is implemented may contribute or detract from its clarity, its uh, precision, its grace. For the typography of a letterhead or calling card, for example, precision is vital. Measurements are made in points. Type sizes are an important part of, an, of any design because they determine scale and proportion. Dimensions of margins are as important as uh, type measurements. So these are some very, very small things that people might uh, ignore or you are giving your presentation to your clients, they might not pay so much attention to the details. So you have to focus their attention to the important minor details which makes or breaks a particular design. And at the end, he always said, treat your logo with respect, right? Treat your design with respect. This is one of the primary things. You have to give it a lot of love. You have to do it with a lot of conviction and definitely you will come out with flying colors. Here is a glimpse of Steve Jobs sitting with those booklets, design booklets that was created by Paul Rand during the presentation of the idea about the next logo. Here are some of the timeless and very, very interesting uh, logo designs which was done by him. Then he said, a good design can touch the emotions and gratify the human spirit, something which is very, very important. You are touching the lives of people, you are touching uh, the emotions of people. So it just doesn't end there. And Paul Rand knew this, that no, this is not the end of it. So what next needs to be done? So that was a time when packaging design was not given so much of importance, right? So he came up with ideas, he came up with graphics that to create interesting packaging for the companies that he worked for. So he was into corporate design. So packaging at in today's time is a very, very important um, important aspect of corporate identity. In fact, uh, if you are buying something, you always look for the kind of packaging that is being provided. So it gives you either a feeling of luxury, it gives you a feeling of importance and it shows that how much a product is being loved that so much uh, detail and so much stress is given on the packaging. And this is exactly what he did. He changed the way we are looking at the packaging industry at present. Then not only just packaging, that is also a very important uh, thing that he did was um, the uh, financial uh, documents or the financial report of each and every company that he worked for. So generally a financial report is a very huge, very boring set of documents which people have to go through. But what he did was he incorporated his design ideas in that also. He um, introduced uh, infographics, he introduced visuals so that the whole uh, experience of going through or reading that financial uh, document becomes more interesting for people where the company also carry forwards its whole uh, idea onto, onto the financial document as well and people would remember what they are reading and it would not be a very, very uh, boring experience for that. So this really increased the value of the companies that he worked for. So design played a very, very important part at that point of time in increasing the value of any particular uh, company. And that is what is happening in today's time. So a lot of every company that we know about, they hire designers, they hire graphic uh, experts to work with the experience, what sort of experience a viewer will be having. And that's how user interface and user experience came into being. Now, Paul Rand was not just a graphic designer, but also he was a phenomenal uh, painter. He did a lot of... Um, paintings he did few movie posters also 
and he also uh, did the interiors of his own house in Connecticut, which was amongst one of the best designed house in that particular year. And you can see that his whole uh, persona and the whole uh, taste of graphic design has been now um, like translated into the interior into the furniture or the products so a designer's life is not just um, you know uh, limited to one forte a person can be good and translate his or her ideas into a lot of different avenues of life these were the books which was uh, written by him and i would definitely want uh, you guys to go ahead and maybe read these uh, books to find more insight into his life then uh, these were some of his last logos uh, he uh, died in the year 1996 but he left behind a huge legacy of work which till today is inspiring people this was one of the last books that was published and to end this particular video a designer's job is to increase the general quality of life. In fact, it's the only reason for our existence. So this was uh, a famous quote by Paul Rand. And this was it, guys. I hope it was inspiring. I hope you got an idea about how these uh, iconic designers have worked and created a mark uh, in the history of design. Thank you so much guys and I will be coming with another set of known designers, introduction to known designers or product or graphic designers as well. Thanks a lot and have a great day.